kick it off, uh, we are going to turn it over to Miss Tony to talk. Hi, everybody. About the hello, hello. Pleasure. Coming to you from Park City, Utah tonight. Gorgeous here. Um, I hope you're all doing well. You know, um, I love being on these calls and learning. So Crystal and Perla, you guys are awesome. So thanks for all you do. It's really been, it's just really been a great few weeks so far. Tonight, I want to talk about, um, really, the topic is pain versus pleasure. And people sort of go like, what does that really mean? But in our brain, a lot of times the reason why we don't follow through on things is because we've associated some sort of pain or discomfort to said activity, whether it be, you know, fitness or nutrition or getting out of a bad relationship or changing a job or going to a job, you know, whatever it is, we've associated some sort of pain to that event. And the only way that you can really change completely is if you then change pleasure to it. Well, people say, I don't think I'll ever find running on a treadmill for 45 minutes at 5.5 miles an hour pleasurable. And that may be true, but that's not how you find pleasure in the event. I don't, I don't find the process of working out personally pleasurable. So I don't focus on the process because if I focus on the process, it creates some pain in my mind. Like I'd much rather binge watch something on Netflix or being here, I'd much rather watch The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. You know, I mean, I'd much rather do something like that. But what you have to do to change that around is associate pleasure to the outcome of the process. So when I'm working out or doing something like that, my main focus is how am I gonna feel after? How am I gonna look after? And I don't mean immediately after, I'm talking long-term. That's how people, by the way, this has been proven. When somebody, um, when, a, when somebody gets engaged, what typically does the female say? I kind of get down to, to my wedding weight. And they're so focused on the outcome and the pleasure of walking down that aisle, looking and feeling a certain way that the process that they've maybe tried to do for 10, 20, 30, 40 years was so hard, it's nothing. Because they're, they're like, I cannot be a bride that looks or feels like this. And they focus on the end result. And what happens? They walked out, tip, I, it's not all women, but you know, I think it was 87% women do this. They get to their, they get in their dress because they associated pleasure to the outcome. And then what happens after the honeymoon? We're starting over, right? Now we got baby weight comes. Okay, so then what happens, right? It goes right back because we associated pleasure only to a short outcome like your wedding. And your brain said, literally, your wedding's over. And then that person didn't associate enough pleasure to how they felt on that wedding day and wanting to feel like that every day. And so they didn't continue that association. Okay. So what happens a lot of times is when we hit our goals, we stop. And that's why it's so important when you hear people say, you have to keep creating new goals. Well, that's why, because, okay, now I feel really good on my wedding day. I look good. I feel good. I, my energy's there. My vitality's there. I fit into the stress. Now I want to stay this way because now I can't tell you the reason, but you have to find a reason. But when you focus on the end result, you will create pleasure to the event that was prior to that not pleasurable. Does that make sense? So when you're going through this process right now, you have got to associate pleasure to the outcome, not the process. There's going to be a part of this process that's not pleasurable. That's okay. But your brain's hearing it as painful. And that's the problem. Because when our brain thinks that something's wrong, it'll do whatever it can, whatever it can to talk you out of it. It's doing its job. But that also, when that bride said, I have to lose X amount of pounds to fit into my dress, she created a level of certainty that it was a non-negotiable. She was not walking down that aisle unless she fit into her dress. Okay. And that created a belief system. Her belief system then said, I can do this. 
So a lot of pain versus pleasure, and this has been a theme starting this morning <laughs> for me about belief system. Every single one of my clients today somehow had something to do with an internal belief system. And so I said, I said the same thing repeatedly. So I'm going to say it to you today. This topic is so important. What you believe about yourself, about any situation, about your relationship, about your future, about anything will dictate your thoughts on a moment to moment basis. And your thoughts ultimately dictate who you are and what you do, period. If you believe that money, and I use this example all day today, if you believe that money is hard to make, you're not going to have the ideas or the creativity or the drive or the thoughts around money that will lend to making money easily. You just won't. So what you believe dictates what you think and ultimately what you do. So you have to believe that whatever result you're looking for through this program is going to happen. Just like the bride believes she's going to get into that dress without having to get it altered. Okay. Because you can't, I said this too, you, you can't get bananas from a lemon tree. If you believe you're a banana and you really want a lemon, you're never going to be a lemon. If you believe you're a banana, you just won't. And what you think you then experience as an emotion. So if you think that this is going to be a waste of time, or you think maybe you'll lose three pounds, but you really wanted to lose 10. So what you're going to, what you think about turns into an emotion. So your emotion may be defeat, hopelessness, blase, whatever, whatever emotion you bring on to yourself. And that emotion dictates what you actually do or not do, whether you stay on the plan or not. It dictates your movement, whether you follow the fitness videos or not, the action that you take on most cases or not take. Because those two things are always in harmony with each other, always. You've got to understand that the pain versus pleasure stems from your belief system. And your belief dictates your thoughts. Wrap your head around this. And your thoughts dictate your emotion, how you feel, and your emotions dictate your actions or lack thereof. And those actions or lack thereof becomes your pattern in all areas of your life, in all areas. And that dictates your end result. And when you, when you, and your results, when you really look at them, if you're really honest with yourself, will reinforce your beliefs. If your outcome is to make a um, million dollars this year, but you really believe that you're worth 50,000, well, at the end of the year, when you make 50,000, doesn't that reinforce your belief that you can only make 50? Because you behaved and felt like that? Your results will always reinforce your belief system and vice versa. And so we're just caught up in this pattern but I, I said this 25 times today, so I'll say 26. The linchpin of that pattern is your belief system, which dictates pain versus pleasure. Because if you believe you can make a million dollars and you're excited about it, it's going to be really pleasurable because your focus is going to be on the outcome. But if you want a million dollars, but you believe you're not, that you're only worth 15, when you go to work, even if it's a great job and $50,000 is nothing to turn your head at, you're going to be miserable and depressed and you're going to believe that you're not worth it. And, and that job's going to create pain and you're going to say, this, I hate this job. I'm stuck in a dead end job, this job. And you're going to poo poo the job. So your pain versus pleasure really does go down to your belief system. Think of it like the body. I think I said this to Perla today. I said, you know, she knows the body better than really anybody. I know these two. Okay. Crazy. And I said something to her, like you have a nervous system. You have an immune system. I said it to her, you talked last week about autoimmune disease and all this stuff. And she knew all this stuff. It went way over my head. But I said, but guess what? Your brain operates off a belief system, which is just as important as your immune system and your nervous system. It's a real system. Belief system isn't just like a catchphrase. It's a system in your brain. Nobody says, oh, your nervous system. Well, that's a catchphrase. No, we have a nervous system. You also have a belief system in your brain, 
which is controlling everything that you do. It's controlling whether you're listening to me right now or not. If you believe that I'm full of it, you're going to be like, this chick just likes to hear herself talk. But if you believe that what I'm saying may have some validity to it, you're going to take notes. It comes down to your belief system. So before you change anything, before you really analyze pain versus pleasure, you have to change your belief. You've got to understand that, yes, I believe this can be true. And so how do you do that? Step one, choose your desired outcome. The very first step is to choose your desired outcome, just like the bride did. And this will help you be very clear, gain clarity about what it is that you'd like to change. Just ask yourself, ask yourself these questions. What goals would I like to achieve by doing this? What's currently preventing me from achieving these goals? What kind of person would I ideally like to become? What is it specifically that I'd like to change? What specific, specific beliefs are not working for me? And what beliefs are preventing me from achieving these desired outcomes? And then step two is just to question those limiting beliefs. Your limiting beliefs are only as strong as the references that support them. So find beliefs that disprove your limited beliefs. Well, I can't lose weight because I have glaucoma. Well, go find somebody with glaucoma that lost weight. That's what I mean. Disprove your belief. You know, I can't do this because, you know, I went to the hairdresser yesterday, so I had to order out. Well, find somebody that brought food to the hairdresser. You see what I'm saying? Find something that disproves your belief. And step three, consider the consequences of your limiting belief. If I don't change this limiting belief, how will I suffer? And associate pain to not changing your limited belief, then the pleasure will come from changing it. Okay? All right, ladies, my 15 minutes is up. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Am I shooting it to Crystal? Yes, Crystal, baby. She's on. Yay. Oh, take it. All right. Shooting it to Crystal. All right. Okay. All right. Perfect, baby. Thank you. All right. Let me get set up here. Learn how to share my screen. Mm -hmm. All right. So thumbs up if you can see my screen. The pain and stillness is what it should say. Beautiful. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Perfect. So let's get started. So who here? has ever been sitting for a period of time, maybe uh, driving in a car, sitting on the couch. Um, and while you've been in that seated position, all of a sudden you just kind of feel this need or this necessity to move your body. Maybe it's to lift your shoulders. You know, you start to move your head back and forth. Uh, you just have to twist a little for that spot in your back to crack just right like it always does, right? Maybe you got to extend your legs all the way out. So here's the deal. That is literally the pain in stillness, okay? I think we've all experienced that at some point in time. I think we all have. And these issues, like I said, they compound over time. And if they're not offset with movement, we're gonna start to have some issues. So let's talk about what to expect, okay? So on your piece of paper that you're taking notes on, cause I'm gonna go over a lot of things. I just want you to write down these five words. The first is sitting. And leave a little space in between each line just so you can take some notes, okay? This is kind of like our outline for tonight. Okay, so the issue is sitting, okay? So that's what we're gonna be talking about. Our lives are sedentary and we sit more than we are designed to. And one of the joints that is adversely affected by all of the sitting is the hip joint. And we're gonna dive in just a little bit below the surface to understand your hips just a little more fully tonight. Don't worry, I'm not gonna get into a whole bit, you know, a whole bunch of jargon and medical terms because I don't wanna overwhelm anybody, but uh, we're gonna dig in just a little bit, right? Cause I think it's helpful to know kind of what's going on inside there so that you can uh, kind of help keep it healthy. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the psoas muscle that uh, begins with P. <laughs> The psoas, it's a muscle we're going to become a little bit more familiar with because I always like to give you a muscle and a move, okay? So this muscle, it's really incredible and it does a lot of really cool things, but it also suffers from prolonged sitting. Another common thing that gets thrown around a lot is sciatica pain. 
Okay, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that because get you know having sciatica sometimes this is affected by sitting the hip issues with the psoas right so sciatica is something we're going to be talking about. Um, it, essentially, this is a back issue, but uh, sitting only adds insult to injury. And then lastly, what we're going to be talking about is just exactly what your hips are responsible for, and that is hip hinging. And it's something that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes thousands of times a day. So just make sure you've got these words. And I'm, like I said, I'm going to share a lot of information, and this is just going to help simplify it. So let's move on. So hands up, who works from home here, just so I can kind of get an idea. So who works from home, or if you don't work from home, who sits for the majority of your job? Okay, so if for your job, the majority of what you're doing is kind of in a seated position. Awesome. Okay. All right. So that's good to know. Good to know. So unfortunately, this is the world that we find ourselves in today, right? And I think it's interesting because most people understand the benefits of movement and just how important it is. But no one's really looking at the nasty side effects of sitting, right? No one's really like discussing that. Everybody's like, get your, you know, everybody's, oh, Crystal, I got my 10,000 in and they're so proud. And that's awesome, right? And I love all the technology in today's day and age in this world because it helps get people more mobile, right? It's getting people to move and, and engage. Um, everybody's obsessed with counting steps. And that's, like I said, that's great. Um, but what we want to make sure is that we also understand that in addition to getting our steps in, for the health of our body, it's important to move it in certain dynamic ways, kind of in these restorative movement ways that we have you uh, doing here in this program. And what it's going to do is that although, you know, steps are great, but this, this um, series of exercises that we're doing has been shown to increase your mobility and your flexibility to decrease the risks of aging, okay? A uh, risks like falling. Okay. And I'm sure you've probably heard in, in uh, past presentations that I've given, you know, the, pe the person who has done these restorative movements and strength trained their whole life, and then the person who is not, they both fall and break either their pelvis or their hip. One returns to the life that they knew, one does not. Okay, the life, that life significantly changes for that person. And I don't know about you, but the world... Uh, right now, if you're in New England, is a little icy. <laughs> and some of us, you know, uh, are, I've heard a lot of people have fallen, right, just because of so much ice. And some people have broken bones while others have not. This is also why we practice balance year round in our circuits. Because if it's not ice this time of year, it's being out on the water, whether you're out on the boat, or you're out kayaking, right? Uh, or maybe you're on uneven ground to begin with, and you like to go uh, hiking. But training for these extracurricular curricular activities is really important. And the reason I'm so passionate about this is because I see so many people living with limitations due to lack of movement or strength. It's one of the two. And two things, by the way, that most people have control over but people have given up thinking that they'd ever go paddle boarding or they'd ever go kayaking again or that they'd ever get the chance to go hiking. And it's almost like because of this lack of movement and this lack of mobility, they've given up on adventure. And it's sad, but it's true. And I want people to be able to take back their sense of adventure. <laughs> That's my passion as a personal trainer is I've seen so many people go from, I can't physically do that to look at me go. And it is the most incredible, empowering thing that I get the pleasure of watching and to be able to give that gift back to somebody. But like Tony said, you can't give that gift to somebody who, who doesn't believe that it's possible. So think about this. If you follow, you know, regardless of what you believe, if you follow evolution kind of back, way back to before wagons anyway, how did people used to get around? We are literally called pedestrians, the root word ped, meaning going on or performing on foot. We traveled by foot, people, and we walked for thousands of miles, not all at once. This was broken up, right, because we're humans, but we've traveled for thousands of miles for food, water, and other resources, right? So movement is life, okay? 
Like I said, regardless of what you believe and how, how we got here, we were designed to move. Our bodies are constructed for it with over 360 joints and 700 skeletal muscles that allow and encourage us to move. Our circulatory system, like that real system Tony was just talking about, <laughs> literally requires movement. So do our bowels, right? These, these functions require movement to function properly. And historians have shown us that as a species, as we've evolved, we've learned to use tools and make fire. We're incredibly resourceful and super intelligent. However, we have evolved to make our world so convenient that we don't even have to get a pen and a piece of paper to make a grocery list. You can just ask Alexa or Siri and say, add kale to my shopping list. The human body just isn't designed for sedentary activity. And yet it's the thing that lots of us are doing the most. So let's talk about your hips. Okay, so I, I really encourage you to think about your own body that you are currently in throughout this presentation as we kind of continue here. So one thing that I hear a lot is, Crystal, I don't know what happened. And I say, what do you mean? And uh, I just heard the story the other day. Well, it was just last year. I was able to go walk all the way out to the woodshed, uphill both ways, carry a huge load, up two flights of stairs, and unload it. And this year, I really struggled with that trip. All of a sudden, I'm feeling bloated. I'm feeling tired most of the time. My strength is gone, and I don't know what happened. But I hate to break it to you. It wasn't all of a sudden. This is something that has been happening subtly in small doses over time, right? Nobody just gets out of bed and twists their knee the wrong way and just tears their, like, you know, ACL. That does, just, just doesn't happen. <laughs> these are these are symptoms that have been creeping up that people have been ignoring for a long time, right? And just pushing it off and pushing it off, chopping it up to maybe aging because that's everybody loves to do that. Oh, well, I'm getting old. It just must be an in, like insert X, whatever it is, right? But we're, what we're talking about here tonight is magic. It is literally talking about rewinding the clock. The human body is an incredible machine. So like I said, I hate to break it to you, it wasn't all of a sudden. We are a direct result of all the decisions we have made. And I tell you what, it's just that all of a sudden you're starting to notice it. So surrounding your hips, if we, if we look at this diagram and, and the body, like I said, it's this incredibly intricate, there's so many you know, different muscles and different bones and, and it can be really overwhelming to understand, right? But if you look at this pulley system, that's right to the right of this uh, picture over here, your hip and your knee are like these pulleys over here. And the muscles are like the ropes in between that push and pull, right? That make it so that you can walk forward and back, kick, jump, whatever it is that you like to do, okay? Sit down, stand up, bend over. And what happens here is that if there is something, right? Like if this muscle is stronger, than the one in the front, vice versa. If this muscle is tighter than the one in the front, even just a little bit over time, it really starts to pull things out of whack, okay? And when you start to pull things out of whack just a little bit, think about your car, right? You're, you're out of alignment just a couple of degrees, and then all of a sudden, what happens? A month or so later, you need new rotors. Mother, so after that, you need new brake pads, right? The system is starting to wear unevenly, okay? Because things are out of whack. How many people here see a chiropractor right now? Anybody? Gotcha. Awesome, awesome. They're really great for putting back together. But we wanna take it a step further. These restorative movements that you're doing are helping to set. The money that you're spending at the chiropractor is being set and kept in place by the restorative movements, right? So let's honor those. So that's, that's just kind of in a nutshell, like I said, to just be aware that if one thing is kind of out of whack or stronger than the other, if you out train or always stand on one hip more so than the other, these things start to affect long-term, right? And then what happens? All of a sudden, Crystal, <laughs> right? 
Um, so like I said, think about your own body as I'm kind of talking about some of these things. Feel free to reach down and to touch. You know, I'll coach you to touch a couple of different areas on your hip bones to kind of be aware because the more you can kind of look inward at this thing and be like, hey, what's going on in here? <laughs> the more you can help treat it. Okay. Uh, all right, let's see. So extended sitting starts to shorten all of these things and really get them out of whack. Um, so let's see, sitting at a desk is really not great. Um, it can be harmful. An analysis actually of 13 studies of sitting time and activity levels found that those who sat for more than eight hours a day with zero physical activity, we're talking, zero physical activity in a day, had a risk of dying similar to the risks of those posed by obesity and smoking just from sitting eight hours a day and not exercising. Another study, this, is, this holds promise, another study from more than 1 million people found that 60 to 75 minutes of moderately intense physical activity a day countered the effects of too much sitting. So what this means is, is that even if you have a sedentary job where you sit, that requires you maybe eight hours a day of just pure sitting. Exercising, can negate some of the negative effects of the job, okay? And it's just, it, this stuff is just really cool to be able to understand. So let's see, what's next? So we wanna understand the hips. So the joint that is affected, right? We've got lots of joints. So if you look at my lovely skeleton right here, let me come back to you. So my skeleton right here. So there's lots of joints in the body, as you can see. <laughs> He's also working on the computer diligently, but he needs a stand-up desk. Um, so the shoulder joint, the neck, right? Obviously we can see that that's gonna take some brunt of sitting as well, but tonight we're focused down here. Okay, so understanding your hips. Um, and people that I work with, oftentimes what we're trying to do is combat sitting, right? The sedentary lifestyle that we find ourselves in. And I wanna show you here on the slide just what happens. So there's a few common issues that happen with the hip. First, I just want you to take a look at this diagram. Oh, I'm going back home. So this diagram right here, uh, the psoas, okay? So just look at the skeletal structure, right? So we got the ribs, and you can feel right in the front, right below your chest, you've got your ribs, right? The one piece that goes down the middle, we've got your spine. There's a little section down here. This is called your sacrum. You don't have to remember what it's called, but this is the piece that when your chiropractor adjusts, they usually start down here. And we usually start with people, uh, you know, just like this program, we start people with working on and understanding hip movement, right? It's the center of the body. Everything that kind of goes wrong with the body starts here and trickles either up or down. That's why oftentimes when your chiropractor starts, where do they start? Your hip, okay? And so this right here is the sacrum. And then down here, we've got your femur bone, okay? So this is the psoas right here and it connects up here at your spine. And it comes all the way down and connects into the back side of your femur right there, kind of like right there tucked in, in the back. And you can see where if this gets swollen or cranky or upset, there is not much space in between this little teeny area that it slides, okay? There's not much space there. And what happens, like if you look at this guy over here sitting, it starts to shorten. And what that literally does is it takes the pelvis and it pulls it out of alignment. Okay, and it starts to tilt, right? So if you put your hands on your hips, it starts to take your hip bones and tilt them forward. Okay, so your belly starts to come forward, right? And with years of this being out of whack, it really starts to throw off the body. Um, and so either it's hip pain or low back pain. And again, it can be caused by many things. It might not just be the psoas, but I like to give you, a, again, a muscle and a move. Um, so like I said, it's really complex, but to just understand that it's important to move this part of your body. Um, I've seen a few people who are past the point of restoration and do require surgery for certain things. Um, but, and, and yes, I understand that surgery is sometimes necessary, but if you follow some of these issues that led to surgery back far enough, oftentimes you can find a place where things could have been avoided and a turn could have been taken to avoid that, right? And I see so many people just accept pain. And I understand pain is a facet of life, right? And it's a really good tool to help learn things. Uh, but they just, people just accepting their pain and they hold on to it almost like it's this new description of themselves. 
okay? Um, and with the help of a professional and asking the right questions, you can really get some awesome answers and, and some solutions to a lot of these problems. And uh, I've really seen people cha literally change their physiology from doing these restorative movements. And I'm, what we're talking about here is from contemplating back or bladder surgery to restoring and managing without. Like I said, mm -hmm. I understand surgery is sometimes necessary, but if you can avoid it, let's try that, right? I've heard uh, professionals say, well, we've exhausted all of your options. I've literally heard physicians say that to people. And what that does is that takes away people's hope. And I, I just, I find it so unfortunate that that is kind of the world we live in when really it's not that we've exhausted all your options. We've exhausted all the options that you know of, <laughs> right? So let's take back that control. All right, so that's a little bit about the SOAS. And like I said, this little guy over here, we want to avoid winding up like him because that's what's happened is that this has just gotten so shortened from sitting over in an you know uncomfortable and terrible position for so long that he just can't stand back up. Okay, all can be avoided. So next, I want to talk about sciatica. Okay, so this is just the back side of the body, and this is the side. So um, over here is the belly, and this is your back. Okay, again, we don't need to necessarily know the terms. We're just looking at pictures here. So sciatica pain, it refers to the pain that radiates along the path of your sciatic nerve, which branches from your lower back, and it goes down through the hip. And like I said earlier, you don't need to be a doctor or a scientist or a personal trainer to learn more about your body. My goal with this is that you just understand this. Right here, where the spine is on the um, person on the right, if you look at her spine, right? Picture the spine is like a power cord, right? This power strip that your computer on, is probably plugged into. So you've got this power strip and you've got this cord plugged into it. And all of these cords come out in these different spots and they all bundle together and they go down through the sciatic nerve and then they branch off into different spots down the leg. And they give you different receptive feedback that tell you different things. Now, you can imagine now from what I've told you, if that this is the back right where that psoas connects right here in the back of the spine. And you can imagine if that's tight or weak from sitting, it can literally start to pull things, meaning your skeletal structure out of whack. Okay, so if muscles in your body are tight, it will start to pull your skeletal structure out of whack, okay? Weakness can also do this, right? But this is the other piece of it that people don't quite realize sometimes. So we've got this beautiful power cord with this very intricate system that runs down the side of the body. Um, and again, it's just helpful knowledge when you're doing these dead bugs and these pelvic tilts, why you are doing them. It strengthens this area and all of those small, teeny, tiny stability muscles in your back and pelvic floor. Remember, we looked at this, we looked at this in this picture of the psoas earlier. Look at how intricate that is where the psoas, everything connects in there. That's like the roads down in Boston, okay? It's intricate. There's a lot of stuff that can go wrong in there. But uh, you don't need to be a doctor or a scientist or a personal trainer to learn more about your body. My goal with this slide again is not to overwhelm you, but to just simply show you that these nerves plug into one spot and travel down the leg. Um, and then, you know, knowing this when you're doing restorative movements and understand if you're skipping them, what you're really skipping. Because this type of restoration, it does something completely different for your body than strength training does. Both are beneficial, yes, but they are different. So if your muscles are tight, what could we also do to help loosen them up? Okay. Foam rolling! Foam rolling. Yes, Pearl, I can see you mouthing it. She's like, <laughs> yes, foam rolling. So picture this. So forget about the psoas for a second. There's a, a million muscles down here. We just looked at it. All of these muscles down here, if they're tight, what are they pulling on? They're pulling on other muscles that are connected to other bones, right? And like, you know, your backbone's literally, if you follow it up far enough, it's literally connected to your neck. Okay. So Understanding how this works is really important and don't skip your foam rolling and your restorative movements because they will literally help prevent misalignment. Now, here is the next slide. Has this changed for you guys? It's just a little, little delayed. Okay, so next I wanna talk about, this is the move. Thanks, Dave. So next I wanna talk about the move, right? I said I was gonna give you a muscle and a move tonight. Mm -hmm. The muscle I gave you was your psoas and here we have the move. 
So we've got a hip hinge versus a squat. Now, you can also do this at home if you have a broom or a Swiffer, you know, whatever. Um, but you can hold this on the back side of your head and the back side of your back, similar to if anyone's ever come here to headquarters for an FMS, you've done something like this. And here's the difference. The squat is an up and down movement, okay? And in both of these, there's a similarity where you want your head, your shoulders, and your butt touching the dowel. And if you have misalignment, you might not feel one or the other, or some of them not touching, okay? And that's, again, why we do these restorative movements. But so the squat, right, proper form is touching all three points. It's up and down, whereas the hip hinge is back and forth. Excuse me. So you know some of us in class, we're doing the squat. The hip hinge, we call that a Romanian deadlift or a single leg Romanian deadlift. That might sound familiar to you, right? I see some heads nodding. Awesome. All right. So this is the position that we're talking about, okay? Just in the single leg version, we're only on one leg. And then we're working balance. Uh, but if your hips are not moving properly, it's going to affect the way your whole entire body works. And we do thousands of hip hinges a day, right? We don't always squat down to pick everything up. I mean, imagine what that would look like if every time you drop something on the floor, you squatted down to pick it up. We don't do that. Oftentimes, we just bend over at the waist, right? We bend over at the waist, and you pick up the pen or whatever it is that you drop. That is a hip hinge when you're sending your butt back and standing back up. Okay. And we do these hip hinges in everything, right? So think about when you vacuum, okay? Think about when you're gardening, when you're picking up the kids, okay? When you're cleaning up after your dog, taking the clothes out of the front loading dryer or washer, whatever it might be, whichever one's on the bottom, maybe they both are, I don't know. But my point is we use the hip hinge thousands of times a day. And this is why it's really important to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Again, this joint is affected a lot when we sit, it's affected a lot, okay? So moving on, let's make the connection. So the more we can really understand about how our body works, the better off we are going to be, okay? So if you take a look at this um, person who came here to do an FMS, if you look at her, she's doing the hip hinge, she's sending her butt back and she's doing the toe touch test. But if you look a little closer, you'll see this flat spot on her back, okay? And she doesn't have any spinal issues, right? Nothing underlying in terms of like scoliosis, stenosis. There's nothing like that here. It's just simply a lack of movement and a lack of, which has led to a lack of mobility, right? Lack of movement leads to a lack of mobility, which then starts to really affect your ability to touch your toes. So what I want to encourage you to do is to tune into your body throughout the day and become present just for a few moments where you put your phone down and you just stand up and listen to what your body's telling you. Unfortunately, we are oftentimes very tuned out from our bodies throughout the day because we're living in either the past or the present in terms of like, what did I do? What do I have to do? That we're not focused on like where we are right now currently in the middle smack dab of what we're doing. So don't ignore your body. Get down on the floor and stretch out when and where you can. Every little bit of movement adds up. So think about something you've learned to do that you didn't know how to do. Like walking or learning to drive a car. You can also learn how to take care of your body by doing research, asking professionals, and attending talks like this. Don't avoid the issues, okay? I see so many times, like I said earlier, people accept the pain don't avoid the issues you might be having with your body. If you're feeling pain, please address it. And if your priority is not your body, I mean, come on. What, literally, what else have you got? <laughs> right? But, you know, unfortunately, some of our society has become like superficial. We're more concerned about like, uh, you know, nice cars or newer things, you know, and it's great to have dreams and to want more. That's really great. And there's, there's really nothing wrong with that but not at the expense or the cost of your health or your body. Because remember, you can't enjoy the sports car or the yacht if you can't get in and out of it, okay? So let's talk about some solutions. So if you wanna avoid issues, like the lack of mobility that we see here on this slide, and I believe my slide's just about to change. Yep, there's just a little delay. Um, so here's some, a few things to help you take a stand, okay? 
So take some time to get used to this. Take a break from sitting every 30 minutes and just stand up. Stand while talking on the phone or watching television. If you work at a desk, try a standing desk or improvise with a higher table or counter, okay? Walk with your colleagues or your friends for meetings and gatherings rather than some type of sit-down meeting. Carlos' favorite, phone roll. <laughs> Do those restorative movements, okay? Very, very important. Or, and or work out with us, okay? So those are my solutions. So just in conclusion, I just wanna say back to the um, five words that we had originally written down is we have, let me see, sitting. It shortens our muscles because we are designed for movement, okay? The hip is the joint that's affected by sitting. The psoas, sitting makes this muscle shorten. Sciatica is just a fancy way of saying you got a pinch nerve. And lastly, we've got hip hinge. It's the most common activity that we do. And you can keep it healthy with restorative movement. Okay. So that's all I have for this evening. I just want to say, let's take a stand against sitting. So thank you so much, everybody. And I'm going to turn this back over to Miss Perla. Hey, Coach Crystal, is she not the best or what? Woo! <laughs> yeah, all the things. Well done, hey, girl. Mom. Well done. That was awesome. I have like a whole page thing of notes. Like, it was fun. Anyway, kudos and thank you for all that information. I hope all you ladies got as much out of that as I did. That was pretty awesome, right? So homework, what? I would like all of you to choose your favorite restorative movement, take a video of you doing it and post it to our private Facebook page. But when you do, I want you to tell me what you have learned about your body while doing that movement. Does that make sense? Do you wanna just repeat it one more time? Yes. So you're gonna take a video of you doing one of the restorative movements and underneath it, write what it is that that movement has done for your body, what you've recognized about your body because of doing that movement. I didn't realize my back wasn't flat on the floor until I was more conscious of it. Right. Clearly I was doing a dead bug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, Becky? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Awesome, any questions? All right, well, I wanna thank you all so much. I wanna encourage you to fill out your weekly thing. Some of the responses we're getting are amazing. Thank you, thank you. And I have a post-it that I'm gonna ask you a question on Facebook tomorrow morning. I'm holding myself accountable by telling you this and I'll expect, I'll expect an answer. If I don't get one, <laughs> I'll hunt you down. <laughs> you know I will. <laughs> All right, lovelies, have a fantastic night. Thank you for your time. Much love to you all. Bye, everybody.